On the night of April 6th, 1844, in Brooklyn, a mob of white Protestant males calling themselves Native Americans marched towards St. Paul's Catholic Church on Court Street, intent on burning it to the ground. As they proceeded, their numbers increased to several hundred with shouts of, the church must come down, the church must be gutted, damn the Irish. When they arrived, a sizable group of Irish immigrants were waiting to defend it with bludgeons, axes, and rifles. But before they came to blows, Brooklyn's mayor called out the military and dispersed the crowds. From the 1830s to the 1850s, such scenes were duplicated in nearly every major American city where immigrants gathered in large numbers. But not all ended so peacefully. In Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, convents and churches were burned to the ground. From Kentucky to Maine, riots left Catholic immigrants and Protestant natives dead in the street. In short, anti-Catholicism had reached a fever pitch in American life, unseen before and perhaps since. The reason was immigration, mainly from Ireland and Germany, which reached unprecedented proportions during these years. Roman Catholicism, once a despised minority, was now America's single largest religious denomination. Reaction was fierce. Would America become a mere papal outpost? Newspapers with titles like The Protestant, The American Protestant Vindicator, and The Anti-Jesuit dedicated themselves to the cause of no popery. They proposed to defend gospel doctrines against Romish corruption. Debating societies addressed the question, is popery compatible with civil liberty? Authors like Samuel Morse the inventor wrote books warning against Jesuit conspiracies to take over the country. Political parties were formed like the American Republicans and the Native Americans. In the 1800s, the term Native American referred not to the continent's original peoples, but to native-born Protestants. In 1835, the Native American Democratic Association won several offices in New York City, pledging themselves to immigration restriction and keeping Catholics out of public life. Over the next two decades, similar parties formed nationwide, but they were confined mainly to the local level. The most infamous and influential of such groups was the American Party, better known as the Know-Nothings, formed in 1849 by New Yorker Charles B. Allen under the title of the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner. Members had to be born in the United States to Protestant parents and not married to a Roman Catholic. They had secret handshakes, secret passwords, and secret signals. Prospective members were asked, are you willing to use your influence and vote only for native-born American citizens for all offices of honor, trust, or profit in, by the gifts of the people, the exclusion of all foreigners, and Roman Catholics in particular, and without regard to party predilections? In short, the organization's purpose was to resist the insidious policy of the Church of Rome and to place in all offices of honor, trust, or profit none but native-born Protestant citizens. They were required to keep secret about the group. When asked about it, their response was, I know nothing. Not all Catholics belong, anti-Catholics belong to the Know Nothing Party, but they certainly supported it wholeheartedly. In the 1852 elections, the Know Nothings captured major offices in several American cities. Their high tide came in 1854 when they gathered control of several states on the eastern seaboard. In Massachusetts, they elected 75 congressmen, a governor, and all the state officers, and the entire state senate. By then, one historian notes, the Know Nothings became the rage of the day. Items with the Know Nothing label included candy, soap, and toothpicks. Stagecoaches and clipper ships were named for it. Members looked forward to the 1856 presidential election when they hoped to sweep their candidate into the White House. Naturally, Catholics worried over the possibility of an anti-Catholic president, but by 1856, other issues overshadowed anti-Catholicism, like slavery and national union. With the rise of a new Republican party, the Know Nothing platform took a backseat to the larger questions of the day. But the group's demise didn't mean the end of anti-Catholicism or, sadly, anti-immigrant sentiment. For example, there was the new Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, which we'll speak of at a later date. But none would gain the influence of the numbers that the Know Nothings had for a brief time in the 1850s, and hopefully none ever will again.